Hi. So, <laughs> hi, uh, Victoria. Welcome to my channel. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, for everyone here in Spain who doesn't know uh, her yet, you must. <laughs> you have to get to know her. Uh, she's an author of fantasy, mostly fantasy genre. And mm, I want to make you some questions. I'm kind of nervous because this is like a surreal moment for me. Oh. Because I don't want to be like, oh, but you're like, like fun girl, but you're one of my favorite authors. Thank you. Um, I value your work so much. I also write fantasy, but I'm like a little author and I look up to you so much. And I want to ask you first of all, how are you? Because you've been <laughs> through like a lot yeah. this month. No, I'm good. I'm good. This is my last yeah. city on a many, many, many city, 11 country, three month long tour. So I'm very happy, but I'm also very ready to sleep in my own bed. Yeah. I'm going to go home after this and I'm going to sleep for a long time. No, this is so exciting. It's my first time ever in Spain. Yeah. And, and is this the beginning? I mean, I'm only here for a very short period of time, but everyone has been so sweet and so warm, and I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you so much. And uh, it's the first time, as you said, in Latin America to us an offer for yeah. you. Yeah. And it, your books have been translated almost between this year and the last year. And I wanted to ask you guys. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like all of a sudden all your books have been brought to here. Yeah. And I wanted to, wanted to ask you how has been the experience with the Spanish speaker audience? I, honestly, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. I have, because my, my publisher is wonderful, um, built a following in perhaps two, three years that has taken me almost a decade to build in the United States. It's, it's wonderful. I'm really fortunate that we have a really like, global time where I can interact with readers regardless of what country they're in. The only thing that stops me sometimes is a language barrier. But um, in general, I'm very fortunate that I get to do that. Everyone's been wonderful. Like I, I couldn't have asked for a better reception. I'm just really excited that people are able to read my stories in more languages. It's surreal because often when a book comes out, uh, it will come out in every country at the same time. But with my books, that hasn't been the case with my books you know, Vicious and Vengeful are just coming out kind of around the same time here. And Vicious came out five years ago in the United States. And so to get to have this almost trickling effect, this, this ripple where I get to speak, I get to reach new countries kind of every few months, it's really exciting. In my channel, I try to talk about books, mm -hmm. but also about writing and the writing process. And I know that you share a lot of this in your social media. Yeah. Um, some questions are about your, uh, your, the way that you have a style and you have your own vibes with mm -hmm. your writing. But I feel that when I pick one of your new books, every time is different, is uh, something completely new, completely fresh. And after all of these books, I don't know how many I've lost the count. How there are a lot, lot of books. <laughs> of books can you write uh, so differently and keep your style? I think it's because I made a rule for myself when I was getting started. I made two rules. I wanted to write fantasy, and so the rule number one was that I could never use a magical system or supernatural creature that had already been done. Uh, I could never use the dictionary definition. I could never say, okay, I'm going to write about vampires. I'm just going to do vampires the way Anne Rice did vampires. Like if I wanted to write about vampires, I had to remake new rules. If I wanted to write about supervillains, I needed to redefine origin stories. If I wanted to write about witches, I had to create my own rules. So I always had to be creating my own rules for what I was writing. And the second rule I set for myself was that I never wanted to tell the same story twice. Even within a series, with Vicious and Vengeful, for instance, Vengeful is not simply a sequel. It's not simply a continuation of Vicious. I had to set new challenges for myself with each and every book. And so I do that because personally, I would get bored. I have to live with a story for a very long time before anybody else reads it. And I want to stay excited and I want to challenge myself. I want to take risks. And I feel like the best way I can do that is to push myself with each and every book. I think I also am really afraid of somebody saying, like my greatest fear is somebody saying, oh, the last book was better. But if I make the books really different, then that, that becomes less the conversation. You might enjoy one of my books more than another one. You might see yourself in one of my books more than another one. But I rarely hear, 
oh, I wish that one had been that one. You know, I want, I want you to think of all of my books as different pieces of fruit, not the same piece of fruit that you compare. So no apples to apples. It's like apple, orange, pear, banana. You might like one kind of fruit more, but I don't want you to be comparing my books to each other. It's really hard because, as I said, it's like a whole new world. You can know that it's one of your books because there's like a vibe or something. Oh, well, thank you. But it's completely fresh and surprising every single time. Thank you. And uh, related with this, uh, with this uh, difference in all of your books, uh, one thing that happens with your son of her and that I've noticed that happened with, um, with uh, other authors that are huge and important and stuff is that you write different for different publics for middle grade yes. you write comics uh, young adult adult and I wanted to ask you uh, how is different as an author but also how is different in the market way yes yeah, so I write for children I write for teens I write for adults in that. I write for those sections of the bookstore and I write with those audiences in mind. But really when I write a book, I'm writing for a specific version of myself. I'm writing for an age of myself. So when I wrote City of Ghosts, it was for 11 year old me. And I asked myself only what did 11 year old Victoria need? What, what did I want to read when I was 11? What didn't I get? When I wrote The Savage Song and our dark duet, I was writing for 17-year-old me. I was a very different version of myself, but it was still me. I still knew what I wanted, what I needed. And I was the kind of teenager who felt so lost, I would have burned the world down to be happy. You know, So I wasn't really interested in these YA narratives where when young women get power, they're expected to give it away. I thought that's not what I would have done with power. And so that's not what Kate Harker does with power no. in the Savage Song. Um, When I write my adult books, I'm writing for whatever age I am at the time. So with Vicious, it was 25, A Darker Shade of Magic, 27, Vengeful, 30, my next book, 31, 32. Um, and so that makes it a little easier for me because I'm concerned less with where it goes in the, sh in the store. And I'm certainly not concerned with what age my reader is when they enjoy it. I think books have a lower age limit, but not an upper age limit. They're like puzzles. It's like eight plus, right? Like, You, City of Ghosts is like eight and up, age eight and up. And um, Savage Song is like 14 and up. And Vicious is maybe 16 and up. And so, but there's no upper. People are like, oh, I'm an adult. Should, can I read City of Ghosts? And I'm like, there's no upper limit. You can be 80 and read City of Ghosts. You can be 14 and read Vicious or, or Savage Song. So I try not to get too concerned with the market aspect. I want to tell the right story and I believe my readers will find it. My primary concern is making sure that my stories are accessible to the people who want and need them. About your characters, I've heard you said in another interviews that you put like a little thing of yourself in every character yes. and I wanted to ask you which one of your characters feels the most like yourself and which <laughs> one have like the darkest oh. side of your self. <laughs> So Victor Vale, the lead in Vicious, yeah. is the most me. He's essentially an autobiographical character because when I wrote Vicious, I never expected it to sell. I never expected anyone else to ever read this story except for me. I was falling out of love with writing and so I wanted to write whatever I wanted. Um, and so I wrote Vicious. And so Victor Vale is a very thinly veiled version of myself, uh, personality-wise, not serial killing <laughs> superhuman, but like, Uh, in, in terms of feeling isolated, feeling set apart, feeling like you have to mimic to fit in, Victor Vale is me. Um, Kate Harker and August Flynn, the leads from The Savage Song, are the darkest parts of myself. Two very, very different facets, two different aspects of my identity, but they both handle anxiety and depression, and they handle them in different ways. And those different ways are the same ways that I struggle with mental health. Kate Harker tries to compartmentalize, tries to block it all out, and she sees um, vulnerability as weakness. And August Flynn 
has this mental spiral where he gets lost inside his own head and he can't find the way back. And I feel like those two are things that I struggle with very intimately. I want to throw a concept at you. At you. Uh, okay. It's something that's been talked about a lot uh, recently, but not so much. Or I haven't seen people talking about it so much before. And I want you to say okay. everything that this means uh, to you. And the concept is representation. Yes, of course. I mean, it's interesting for me. Um, it took me a very long time to realize I was gay. Uh, it took me 28 years. So there's a very obvious transition in my books as I realized that I was fighting with this thing all along, but I didn't have a vocabulary for it because I didn't see myself in books. I would see strong girls who were very like tomboy, who were very masculine, and I would see queer women, but I would never see the two halves together. I would never see myself in one person. I'd have to cobble myself together from multiple people. And I think my goal as a writer is to help more readers see themselves. I want to make sure that, that marginalizations and minorities get to see themselves not only in the story, but vital to the story, at the center of the story, not a token, not at the edges of the narrative, not the first ones to die, not the disposable ones, yeah. but absolutely intrinsic to the value of the narrative. And I also, quite honestly, I don't want their, because I'm writing fantasy and I'm trying to create a better version of the world in that way, I don't want their marginalizations to be the defining aspect of their character. For me, I feel like straight people are never reduced to their sexuality, only queer people are reduced to their sexuality. I feel like white people are rarely reduced to their race, but black people are reduced to their race all the time. I don't want this reductive representation. So when I put queer characters in my narrative, their queerness, their sexuality is an aspect, but it's not the defining force for them. They, 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 have lives and plots and storylines that have nothing to do with their sexuality, the same with race, the same with gender. I simply want them to be able to take up the same amount of space in the story that it's always given to like hetero, white, cisgender men. Yeah, I have to say that I'm currently reading a bench book. Yes. And it makes me so, make me so happy the way you <laughs> yes. You know, you just said that uh, the canon um, Victor being ace, yes. but it was like so natural yeah. and this, this wasn't, as you said, like you're just that and that's all. Yeah, it wasn't, it was very tricky, especially with yeah. Victor. So I always imagined Victor as asexual, but I did not make it canon in Vicious. And looking back, I really regretted that because there's a very big difference between you seeing yourself yeah. in a story and the story acknowledging you. And I feel like I had a lot of asexual readers who saw themselves in Victor, but the book didn't say to them, I see you, yeah. you know? And so Vengeful was a moment for the book to acknowledge its audience, for Victor to acknowledge its audience. But because Victor is also a very uh, compartmentalized person, yeah. uh, I knew that he wouldn't stop at the narrative and have like a PSA moment, like he wouldn't talk about this. So it was difficult to put him into a context where it could come about naturally. And I didn't want to make more of it than I had to, but I wanted it to be clear. It was very important to me that it was clear. And I uh, also want to ask you about something that, um, I don't know how to, to put it, but uh, you said that you almost fell out of love with writing when yeah. you listen, and I can totally relate with that. And uh, one of the things I want to ask you about is how you deal with criticisms, mm -hmm. if you, uh, I don't know if it hurts you still after all this time, if it's noise for you? Um, I mean, look, criticism always engenders kind of an automatic response. We want to like put our arms up. We want to like not hear it. Um, there's valid criticism. There's criticism that we need to hear to make ourselves better, to make our work better. And then there's simply the fact that you cannot write a book for everyone. If you write a book trying to please everyone, you end up pleasing nobody. You have to write a book for a specific audience. You have to write a book for a specific person. So the larger my audience has gotten and the more readers I've had come to me and say, this was the book I needed. Vicious was the book I needed. The Savage Song was the book I needed. City of Ghosts was the book I needed. A Darker Shade of Magic. Someone who saw themselves in the book makes it very easy 
to not be disheartened by people who didn't. So when a person says to me, oh, that book, I didn't enjoy that book. I say, that's fine. There are plenty of other books out there that you will enjoy. But it means more to me than that somebody does find themselves in that book, does see themselves, does need that book. I would much rather have 10 people for whom Vicious is perfect than 100 people for whom it was good. Well, and as you said many times, writing is hard. And <laughs> it's really hard. Yes. And I think that's something that's really important and is a lot in the conversation right now too, is self-care. Um, how do you take care of yourself when you're writing <laughs> and when you're struggling? Badly. I don't do a very good job of it, as noted by the fact that so many of my readers online are continually like, please take a nap, <laughs> please take rest, it will be okay. Um, no, I try. For me, physical health and mental health are really tied together. So exercise is important, eating healthy is important, getting fresh air is important, getting sleep is important. I also think I have to refill the creative well. I have to, whenever I, you know, I have creative output, whenever I'm writing, I need to have creative input. I need to go to movies, I need to watch television shows, I need to read books, I need to make sure that I'm feeding not only my body but my heart and my mind and my soul in that way. So I try to make sure that I put the energy back in. There's like a lot of uh, strong female characters, but they're very different, yes. each one uh, from the other. Uh, for example, uh, Laila has nothing to do yes. with Marcela. And they're stuff. very, very they're different. Very different. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, because I'm curious about this, about any real life uh, role model you have. Well, I think I have strong women in my life in all forms. I have had, obviously, my mother, and I've had friends, found family, found siblings. But I'm also, when I write my female characters, I'm writing who I want to see and who I want to be. Lila Bard was an aspirational character for me. She's who I wish I could be. And specifically, she's how I wish I handled fear. You know, it's not that she doesn't feel fear, it's that she sees fear, she acknowledges fear, and then she stabs it and pushes its corpse aside and keeps going, right? Maybe literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite literally for Lila. But I wanted to write women who possessed something I didn't, or who possessed something I wanted to possess to an extreme degree, right? Like, we've all experienced the microaggressions that Marcella Riggins experiences going through this world. We've all had people talk down to us. We've all had people discount or diminish us. But most of us don't go around and turn those people to ash uh, with a smile. And Marcella gets to become an avatar for a little bit how many of us wish we could. There's this moment in Vengeful where Marcella is at a a, a rooftop party with her mm -hmm. husband and she's surrounded by men yeah. and she makes a helpful remark they're talking about business and she makes a remark a very smart remark and all of the men around her stop talking and there's this moment where her husband could support her and could you know uh, legitimize the remark in, in his friend's eyes and instead he laughs and he says, my wife, the business major, and completely, and then the other men say, Marcella, wouldn't you be happier with the other women? And like, we've all been in a situation, I mean, I'm a female fantasy writer, yeah. so the number <laughs> of times per day that I am told that I shouldn't have mm. ambitions or that I should just be happy for what I have or that I shouldn't, you know, want more or that I'm out of my place or out of my element. I mean, Marcella was important for me because I needed I needed that microphone. I needed somebody who could act out. Yeah, that's so good because I think that the readers we need to characters like that. Oh yes. Too. And uh, one last, I want to make like a lightning round. Okay. But before I want to make <laughs> one last question, and I'm very happy right now because in Spain there's like a new wave of young female mm -hmm. fantasy authors, and this is something completely new. That's so exciting. And it's so exciting to be a part of it. And I wanted to um, ask you to give a little piece of advice to all of these new yes. authors. Whew. Um, okay. Advice for publishing specifically. Here's yeah. what I'm going to say. Publishing likes to make a very large deal 
about the new, the new, your first book, your debut. They put an immense amount of pressure on this one title, on this idea that you are brand new. And it, we, it's the only industry, I always joke and say, you never go in for surgery and someone says, he's a debut doctor. He's never performed or she's never performed surgery before. Give her all the money and some very sharp knives. She'll do great. Yes. But in publishing, we do this, right? And so the advice I give to upcoming authors is the same advice that I have to give myself daily. And that is a reminder that for the vast majority of us, we will not be formed by one book. Our career will not be made by one book. We are a collection of a body of work. You will be the result and your readership will be the result of three or five or 10 books. And so we have to put less weight on one book. It's not fair to us and it's not fair to the book. And also you can do everything right with a book and that won't be the book that finds you your largest audience, you know? Like my eighth novel was A Darker Shade of Magic that has my largest audience. Vicious was my fourth. Vengeful was my 15th, you know? So you have to remember that like with each book you are growing and you don't need to come all the way out here with one book. All you need to do is increase your footprint with each and every one. So look at the long con, look at the long game. Yes, like about perspective. Yes, absolutely. And now the lightning, lightning round. round. I Maybe. promise to be nice. Almost. Okay, um, first I'm ready, question. I'm ready. Uh, which book are you currently reading? I'm currently reading a book called Ninth House, which is Lee Bardugo's next book. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm English right now. A uh, childhood book, but not Harry Potter. Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. Oh, that's one word. And uh, TV show to binge watch. Killing Eve. Okay, and na, 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 na. Uh, your current obsession. Good omens. A favorite social media app? It, probably Instagram, but don't tell Twitter. <gasps> I wasn't expecting that I one. Know, I know. <laughs> Welcome to. Uh, I know, it's so bad. It's so bad. Um, sorry, I don't understand my own writing. <laughs> Add an offer from another time that you would love to have tea with Oscar Wilde. A book that you wished you had written. <sighs> Probably the graveyard book. And then a character in a darker state of magic world that you think that would be famous if he lived in today's world. Alucard Emery. A character from Vicious that you think that would probably be a pirate in the darker state of magic world. Vish Victor. Yeah, Victor. <laughs> So that's all yeah. for me. Uh, thank you so much thank for your you. answers and for being so honest always of course. and so open. And I hope that you have enjoyed this interview. And if you don't know her work, you should. You must <laughs> go and be one of her books. Go right read now. something. Please, we need to talk about her <laughs> books. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you. you very much for being here.